Hey there, U-Turn friends. It's Ash here, and I'm so excited to bring Park Howell onto the show. He's known as the world's most industrious storyteller, having grown purpose-driven brands by as much as 600%. He's an Emmy award-winning 35-year veteran of the ad industry, Mm -hmm. advertising industry. And now he consults, he teaches, he coaches, and he speaks all over the world to help tell businesses and sales and marketing leaders really excel in how they tell stories. And you know me, I've my team has written more than 100 TEDx talks. We've booked more than 1,200 of them. Storytelling is really at the helm of my day-to-day life. So when I can talk to someone who really knows what they're doing with stories, it's like my ears could not be more open. He's also the host of a very popular weekly uh, podcast called Business of Story Podcast. Um, It's ranked in the top 10% of downloaded podcasts in the world. He's published uh, Brand Bewitchery in 2020 to help you use his proven story cycle system to craft spell-binding stories for your brand. And in 2021, he co-authored The Narrative Gym for Business, which is a 75-page guide on how to use the foundational narrative framework of the ABT and But Therefore to make you a more confident, compelling, and persuasive communicator. So clearly, my cup runneth over. Uh, Park, thank you so much for making the time to come on. Oh, Ashley, thanks so much for having me. I love talking to a fellow storyteller as well. And I can't believe you have done that many TEDx talks. That's that's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's, do you know what's interesting? Like it's still kind of a new business because for a lot of years I was helping career coaching clients. I had a career coaching business and I would tell them my TEDx talk, it changed my life. Like as a business owner, the amount of opportunities, I tripled my keynote fee. I, I mean, just as an entrepreneur, it did so much for me. Um, I got a speaking agent. I want a speaking tour. And so for me, I'm always thinking like, how do I get people to really listen to somebody else? Like that's at the helm of the success of our company. Um, and so, yeah, I want to start there. Like what got you so interested in the art of storytelling? Uh, well, it, you know, you had mentioned in the in the uh, lead up to this, I've been in the advertising, branding, marketing world almost 40 years now, and I ran my own ad agency for 20 of those years, loved it the first 10, and then not so much, actually, the second 10, and the, it started in 95, and so in the early 2000s, as the internet took over and e-commerce and then social media came to bear, I had a hard time understanding how do you use this new medium? to be able to brand and promote products and services. And to me, it just seemed like so much noise coming at all of us that I realized that our traditional work in print, radio, TV, that sort of thing, wasn't working as nearly as effectively in, on, on social and on the internet. So I went looking for an answer. And luckily, the universe paid that off in our middle child, our son, Parker, who was going to film school at Chapman University in Orange, California, a very prominent film school uh, between 2006, 2010. And I said, hey, Park, uh, Parker, send me your recorded lectures and your books when you're done with them, since I'm paying for them, because I want to know what does Hollywood know about storytelling to stand out? And and Ashley was purely to find an answer to how were we going to make our advertising work online? Hmm. And uh, that's when I first studied it. And I started finding everything from the hero's journey to Blake Snyder's 15 beats to story to the Pixar way. And I realized those were all great for Hollywood, but they don't work so well in business. And that's where I created my 10 step story cycle system inspired by all of those frameworks, but really mapped to branding in business. And it was, it was literally a science experiment at first. Mm-hmm. And the first time I used it on a client and they started enacting it, um, they ended up growing by 600%. And I was wow. like, oh my God, there's something to this. And that's wow. when I really dove wholeheartedly into storytelling to understand why and how it works. Wow. Okay. So I know a lot of people listening, maybe they've heard of the hero's journey and that's kind of like the limit of what we hear about like a storytelling arc. I remember when I got my book deal in, I think it was like 2018, um, I felt so intimidated because I was so used to writing blog posts and things that were kind of short form. And I'm thinking like, how am I going to keep telling a story for 200 pages? Um, so if I want to kind of 
work with different types of people on this podcast. Mm -hmm. Like one is somebody who has a long thing, like a book. Another one is the kind of person that has a short thing, like a speech in front of their team at work. Um, what are some of those core components that you're thinking about as somebody's looking at this commitment that they have, whether it's a book mm -hmm. or a speech and they're thinking, okay, this has to be good. Where do we begin? <laughs> right. And in the first thing I would tell them, is throw out the hero's journey. Throw out Blake Snyder's 15 beats. It's too complicated unless you're already a story theorist or you're really into learning about that stuff. Most business people I talk to are like, no, just show me what works. And so actually over the course of my years of going from the very complex hero's journey story cycle system on down about 10 years ago in 2013, I learned what I believe is the DNA of storytelling and it's just three words and but therefore mm -hmm. and you can look at the huge hero's journey and realize it's set up as an and but therefore an abt as we call it the agile narrative framework it's not something that we invented it's been around since the beginning of storytelling but all the training i do now in in answer to your question i would say first start and learn the and but therefore get these three words down and how you structure them and then it helps you focus your message in your stories to clarify them and it gives you that singular narrative thread throughout an entire book or a ted talk or a sales presentation or you can even use it in your email writing <laughs> to be mm -hmm. able to become more compelling. So mm -hmm. that's what I do. I, I want it to be simplified for people so that they can understand it and use it immediately. And then they build on that framework. Mm. Mm. Okay. And, but therefore, I feel like people are listening and thinking, what the heck? And, but therefore, <laughs> what do we, what do we do with that? So let's say, you know, Sally's listening. She's got a big speech yep. at work next week. And she's like taking her pen down right now. She's saying, and, but therefore, like, where does she go with that? What the heck? Okay, yeah. great. What the so heck? It's, <laughs> it's Sally. The first thing I'm going to ask Sally to do, and let me give you a real quick structural lesson on the ABT. The ABT is the triparate structure to story, meaning the three acts of setup, problem, resolution. Um, act one, the and, is the and statement of agreement. We are simply setting the stage getting everyone in the audience in Sally's presentation nodding, saying, yep, yeah, yep, I, I can agree with where that vision is we want to go. The but is the statement of contradiction, the plot twist, or act two. But we're not there yet, or we're frustrated because of this major problem. Then the act three is the therefore statement of consequence. Therefore, picture it when we get what we want by doing this to get us there. What we're doing with the ABT and the three-part structure to story of agreement, contradiction, consequence is playing to that primal subconscious limbic brain. It's pattern-seeking, problem-solving, decision-making, buying brain. People think we buy with our rational frontal neocortex. We don't. We buy with that emotional center, that survival brain, that primal limbic brain. So the ABT delivers messages and stories directly to that limbic brain on how it wants to receive it and make meaning out of the madness of being in this world. So the very first thing I would tell Sally is identify your audience, be as specific as you possibly can. Now say she is giving this sales presentation or a presentation around an initiative internally. I want her to identify that audience. What do they care about? Are these C-suite people? Are they chief marketing officers? Is it HR what? All right. Then I want her to answer, and this is all in the statement of agreement, identify your audience, uh, detail what is it they want relative to what you have to offer. They don't even realize what you have to offer yet. You've got to do your homework. What is it that they want and why is it important to them? You raise the stakes. Mm -hmm. So you get them nodding. Yes. Yeah, that's you're right, Sally. That's exactly what we want. You've done your homework. You understand us and you appreciate what's important to us. Then she goes, but we're all frustrated. You're frustrated because of this major problem standing in our way. And they're going, oh, my God, you're right. Yeah, that is how I feel. Mm -hmm. And what are we going to do about it? Therefore, here's the way forward if we all pull together and do this 
to achieve this. Mm -hmm. Setup, problem, resolution. You have a singular problem solution dynamic narrative. Um, you have the three act structure of story of agreement, contradiction, consequence, and you're delivering it to that problem solving, decision making, buying brain in the way it wants to receive story. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah, I almost want to apply it to a TEDx talk. We have about 32 of them we're writing right now and booking for. And um, I kind of think of each talk in a similar way, but I, I haven't thought about it in this way. I'm I'm constantly thinking when I start writing a TEDx talk, like how do I move the audience and make people want to listen to this person? Like, how do I share this person's story or life in a way that people want to know them and keep listening. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the way you're saying it is the and, like agreeing universally on something. Um, so let's say that we had a TED, TEDx talk for a leadership coach and she, you know, goes into companies and helps prevent burnout amongst employees and she coaches employees. How would you start thinking about her speech? Um, yeah, just kind of yeah, then, based on what we shared. So, okay, so let's use burnout. That is going to be our one word theme. We're going to focus on burnout, and that is going to help us get down to that singular problem solution narrative. All right. Now, the first question I'd ask, Ashley, is who is sitting in the audience? Can you, in your fictitious audience, or maybe, maybe this is a real world thing, who is sitting in that audience? Well, that's what's so interesting is it's like the TEDx audience it's YouTube, right? It's like everything from John Doe in middle of America, people in New York. I mean, it's all over the world. So I guess, what would your response be to that kind of a situation? Would you say, pick the people you want to listen? Yep. Um, you've got to. You've got right. to identify your audience. Now, I did a TEDx in 2018 here in Arizona, and they told us straight out, the audience are the 20-somethings that are sitting here in front of us. And it's how can they live into a more powerful story? So that that was the theme. So mm -hmm. I knew when I did mine, I was speaking directly to some of these youngsters that were still in college, to the young professionals, and those that were getting sucked into the social media, you know, fictional stories out there and how to really find their story. So I, mine was first look, find your scenes and then your story will find you. So what I would say is, Who's that one audience you're talking to to avoid burnout? It could relate to everybody, but you got to get super focused on that audience. Otherwise, you start running all over the place. So let's say, for instance, why don't we say it's, you know, the, the 30 somethings right. because they're really finding their pace. They paid their dues, you know, in their 20s. And now they're like, I've got the tiger by the tail. This is awesome. But they're starting to feel burnout or They've seen others ahead of them, older than them, burn out, and they don't want that to happen to them. Mm -hmm. So I would say I would try to identify that audience and say, you are a dynamic, forward thinking business professional, mm -hmm. something like that, you know, mm -hmm. um, and you might even throw out, you know, thir a 30 something business professional, you, you know, and you want to create the best life in the most stellar career you could possibly imagine. Now I'm just winging it here, Ashley, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's that our statement of agreement. Mm -hmm. You were this, you want this, and it's important to you because you want this great fulfilling life with a career that may even deliver a legacy after you're done with it. Mm -hmm. But, and so then I like to insert an emotion right after that, but, but you're afraid but you're frustrated, but you're fearful, but, but, but what is the angst that they are feeling because they've seen those that have gone ahead of them and or they're feeling it themselves of having this tremendous burnout. Life is not what they thought it was going to be because they haven't done a good job of balancing their life. So you're trying to just get everyone in that audience to be nodding yes, because God, it's just like Sally's talking right to me. Well, Sally was talking to the corporate world, right? This is someone else talking to the TEDx world. Wow, she understands me. She she knows what I'm looking for. Therefore, you know, in, in this in this next, and you don't have to use the word therefore, you know, um, but imagine having that fulfilled life. And I'm going to show you the three most important steps to make that happen. How do I know it? Because it happened to me. Let me take you back to December 21st of 
2018 and we were wrapping up the year and we're working into the holidays and I should have been really excited because I had my best year ever, but I was exhausted. I was burned out. I didn't even really care about the holidays with my family. I just wanted to go home and sleep. Boom. And then you get into it. People are like, oh, wow. Okay. She's just not preaching this to me. She has experienced her, herself. Therefore, I want to listen to her. What did she do to overcome that, that I could learn you know, to do? And what's that one big surprising thing that she did? Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm I'm listening to you and I'm just thinking like it's really conversational some of the way that you're relaying how you, you know, connect with other people. Um and it just reminds me there's so many different ways to tell stories and I guess there's some like um ambiguity because on one side it's like yes, speak to your ideal customer, but then when I'm writing a TEDx talk with my team, we're very much like, okay, but we also need to be aware that everybody's watching this. So let's write it at a fifth grade reading level. So it's kind of like being singular and like, this is who we're talking to, but we're going to make it accessible to these other people as well. Um, and so you kind of don't have to compromise on your method while also, you know, being more widespread, which I think is really great. Um, you know, as I was looking at, you know, your body of work and, and all that you have to say, um, yeah, like I, I would I would be curious to understand virality and ad campaigns you've worked on um, outside of the ABT when you're just looking at campaigns you've worked on or things that have done really well that you've had some sort of touch point with. Um, what have you seen happening um, that has taught you something about storytelling outside of the framework? You've got to be, well, you know, everyone says authentic. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. But gosh, I have heard that word so many times on my podcast. Now I, it's like, we got it, got to be authentic. And I'd like to even take that one step further. And you've got to be really honest. And by that, what I mean is understand that audience, whether it's a TV commercial or a YouTube video or whatever, and speak directly to what they're feeling. Be honest about that. And I, I have found that to be by far the most powerful way. And, it, and it, it, it lasts, it's longevity. For instance, let me take you back way back 20 years ago, 2003, we were doing a TV campaign for Goodwill of Central Arizona. Uh, Goodwills are franchises, most people don't know that, all around the, the world, actually. And they take in your belongings and, you know, sell, reuse, and then um, they use that money to do workforce development to help get people trained to put them back into the community. So we were doing this one 30-second commercial. And my wife, Michelle, she's an interior designer, and she loves to go to thrift stores and Goodwills and whatever, but she was secretive about it because she was afraid that her friends would make fun of her or look down on her. But she goes, it's, in fact, she came in one day in our living room, and she was whispering to me, Ashley. She goes, I just got this such and such blouse. It was this pretty blue, bird's eye blue uh, blouse. She goes, I just got this blouse for $15. And it's tip, it's regular $150 over at Nordstrom's. And look, the tags are still on it. And I'm like, why are you whispering to me? We're the only <laughs> ones in our home. And she goes, well, and I knew why, because she just was embarrassed about that. So we made a commercial. And it was 30 seconds long. And by the way, the protagonist's name was Michelle. She was coming out of a Goodwill with all of her bags, just of all the stuff she bought. And she ran into her friend coming into the store. And her friend goes, Michelle, what are you doing here? Shopping? Oh, no, I'm just dropping off. And she acted as if all that stuff she just bought, she dropped off in the donation bin. And she goes, how about you? And her other friend didn't want to admit she was shopping at Goodwill. She goes, no, no, just dropping off too. Okay, we'll see you later. She, Michelle walks out of the door. The, the lady grabs a cart, runs in to go shopping. And then Michelle sneaks in, grabs her bags out of the, the donation bin, and off she goes. Ends up good stuff, good work, goodwill. Well, when we created that commercial, we showed it to Keith Mason, who was the CEO at the time. And he said to me, and it was a brand new account for us. It was the first work we had ever done, but we had done our homework and I lived with a closet shopper. And uh, um, he goes, I don't want to run this because I'm afraid that our customers are think we're making fun of them. And I said, no, 
your customers are going to appreciate the fact that you're recognizing them and what are the emotions that drive them there. And he said, okay, we'll run it. If it doesn't work, you are fired. This is our very first commercial ever. Um, and he goes, do you still want to run it? And I go, yes, because I believe in it. The story behind it is talking directly to, honestly, to that audience. And anyways, actually, we ran it. Same day sales per store went up next month by 43%. Mm. And they just said, wow, this blew our mind. People still talk about the commercial when I said, oh, yeah, we used to do Goodwill way back in the day. Were you the ones that did that Michelle commercial running in and out of there? So I, even though it's 20 years old, it's relevant today because we have to understand our audience, what's driving them. And then we need to speak to that emotion and even out them sometimes right. and say, we get it. We understand. That's why we're here to help you get what you want. I love that so much. It actually reminds me of a TEDx client. So a lot of people who have come in, um, we have an intake form because we we write and book the whole talk in four meetings. And I mean, we do a lot of the work outside of the meetings, of course, mm -hmm. but um, the intake form, originally when I started the business, I just looked for the craziest story of people's life because I was like, that's going to get people to pay attention. And as I've continued, it's really the more vulnerable personal stories that aren't like big, wild stories. Um, we have a client who her most embarrassing story is in high school. And um, she felt like she was pudgy and a little bit awkward. And um, I guess the popular kid had a party at his house and she was there and the girl said, oh, he has a crush on you. And she went to the bathroom to get herself looking all nice. And then she got out and found out that he thought she was gross and he said something mean. And it was like that vulnerable story touched me so much more than the crazy story grabbed my attention. Mm -hmm. And it just taught me that storytelling um, doesn't have to require this whole to do from anyone. It just needs to be relatable and personal. And I think the things we hide, the things we don't want pe people to know are such portals into great storytelling. So the fact that your wife whispered to you <laughs> about something and you turn that into an ad. Um, okay. So let's say somebody listening works in advertising, they work in storytelling. What are some books outside of your own work that have deeply influenced how you approach stories? Yeah. Um, one of the first ones I would recommend is called The Writer's Journey by mm -hmm. Christopher Vogler. He was really the first screenwriter in Hollywood to identify this thing called The Hero's Journey, even though it had been around since literally the very beginning of recorded storytelling. It was Joseph Campbell in the 40s, 50s, 60s that really started identifying The Hero's Journey and brought it to everyone's attention. Uh, Vogler was a screenwriter and screenwriting coach for Disney. And when he was reading through Campbell's work and he's going, oh my God, we're doing this. We're following this pattern. We didn't even know it. So he was the very first one to articulate it. He has a marvelous book. I think it's in its fifth edition and mm -hmm. it's called The Writer's Journey. It's all about how the hero's journey works, how we see it day in and day out in our own lives and in the movies and things that we watch. Um, that's that's one of my favorite all-time books on you know, writing and storytelling in business. Others include, um, or for the advertising world, there's, you know, there's not a lot of them that I really relied on. I've, I've read, it seems like just about everyone. And I think it goes back to really understanding the classic story structure, everything from the end, but therefore up to these larger frameworks and then make them your own. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be, you know, the other book that I would recommend it. This one is mine. It's the one I co-wrote with Dr. Randy Olson called The Narrative Gem for Business. It's that short guide you talked about, about understanding the ABT. And we show you where it shows up in all different kinds of story frameworks and formats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you, I know that you work with so many different people in so many different capacities. Um, like, I would love to just hear a little bit about how you work. Like what, what are some of the problems you're trying to solve with storytelling that different marketing and entrepreneur consultants come and find you for? Here's what they always ask. And this was the thing, Ashley, that surprised me the most when I really started doing this full time when I 
pivoted away from my ad agency and in 2016 started the business of story. Large brands, small brands, everything in between. The first thing that they would say is we need our people to consistently tell our story the same way. They can mm -hmm. tell it in their own voice, in their own way, but we need to build this storytelling culture. So that's the first thing I do. Here's what happens, actually. People think they're telling a story and they're not. They're mm -hmm. going and, 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 and. They never get out of exposition. They mm -hmm. never get out of act one. Mm -hmm. And it's boring. So when people think they're telling a story, they're not really telling a story. Uh, that's why you get the and, but therefore. So I come in, like, for instance, some of my customers, uh, Walmart Canada, we are training thousands of their associates how to use the and, but therefore to be able to make their messages land right the first time internally mm -hmm. um, and, and not going on and on. And a lot of them are new uh, managers that have been leveled up into leadership and the leaders above them are saying, they don't have the presence yet. They don't know how to tell that story like you talked about Sally coming in. Yeah. How can we give them confidence and get them to get to the point? Mm -hmm. So a lot of my storytelling frameworks are about just getting your message to land right the first time, whether it's a story or not, by first mm -hmm. using the ABT and then teaching them how to tell an anecdotal story. So a lot of my work comes through learning and development or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, departments and large brands, or I work with a lot of sales and marketing teams that are trying to sell something, especially now in the tech and the AI world, where it's con convoluted. They're all over the place. And the mm -hmm. poor prospect is sitting there going, what in the hell are you talking about? I get them to use the frameworks to get super focused and then drop in little anecdotal stories about the impact that they're making that shows their, their impact, you know, their outcomes. Um, versus just pounding their chest and talking about their features and functions. So, so a lot of it is internal communications. And, you know, another side of that then is the sales and marketing side. And mm. it's all about clarifying complex stories so that it become much more compelling. Mm. Okay. Is there something I haven't asked you about your method or about storytelling that if somebody walks away today, you would want to make sure that they know that from this episode? A couple things. Yeah. Um, even when you're telling a story about yourself, that you are the central character in this story, I want people to realize that in the telling of that story, it's actually not about you. Your stories are always about your audience, and you've got to really understand what motivates them, what's in it for them. So even when you're telling a story about a personal uh, moment that something happened, um, that they can feel like they can live vicariously through you. So your stories are always about your audience. You are simply the conveyor of that story. You've got to get them to buy in. Second thing I would say is your stories are not about what you make, but what you make happen, right? Mm. So Ashley, in your world, your story, really, you're not selling the frameworks. You're not selling the vehicles in which to get people stardom and impact from a TEDx talk. You're selling them the outcome. You know, when you are done with this TEDx talk that we're going to help you craft, you know, your business can explode. It can give you that virality you're looking for. So for all of you out there, when you are telling a story, nobody actually cares about your features and your functions. And even they actually don't care about your system. Mm -hmm. They don't care about what you make. They only care about what you make happen in their life. Mm -hmm. Now, that system is that important tool to get them there but that's not what your story is focused on. Your story mm -hmm. is focused on outcomes. I love that so much. And it's something that I think we can all take with us. And I think my final question is just around elevator pitch. If somebody has 10 to 30 seconds to tell somebody, like let's say they're at a networking event and they want to make something happen. They have a new business. They need more clients. They want press coverage. They want something. How do they authentically create their story in that tiny little bite-sized chunk to move their career forward in some way? I love that question. Elevator pitch, you can do it in one floor. It doesn't take 20 floors. And here's what I like to have them do is start with a question. So Ashley, say you and I are on an elevator and I ask you, you know, what do you do? And if you didn't have an answer, I'm sure you do have an answer, but here's what I would, how I would coach you and anybody out there listening and watching this, ask a question. And, and in your case, it might be, have you ever gone to a TEDx talk or watched one, you know, really excited about the speaker and what they're going to deliver to you? But 
it just bombed and you actually felt really bad for that person, well, I make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. There's, I love there's that. A, there's an and but therefore starts with a question that brings them in. Have you ever shared vision, gone to a TEDx talk or watched one and you were so excited about the presenter and what the topic was all about, but they bombed <laughs> and you even felt badly for them. Well, I make sure that doesn't happen. Hi, I'm Ashley, and you know, so on and what you do. Mm, that's so interesting. I I would I don't I I think at first pass with your method, somebody may not see the and as a question. How can you make sense of that for everybody listening? Yeah, because you're not delivering, you can make that and statement of agreement either a statement with a period or a question. All you're doing is you're not inserting the problem yet. You're just getting them into the scene with you, into your story. You're introducing them to a TEDx, or you could even say just a speaker. Have you ever gone and seen a speaker and really excited about who they were and the message that you were promised was going to be delivered to you? Yeah, yeah, we have, but they bombed. Oh my God, yeah, I've seen that happen. We make sure that doesn't happen, especially for TEDx and TED Talk speakers. So you can do that. You're not inserting the problem up top. You're, share, you're sharing this vision of like, yeah, that excitement, but uh, the bummer by it going sideways. Therefore, you make sure that never happens. Mm, mm, mm. This has been so much fun. Um, I hope everybody remembers to check out the guide. We'll put the info in the show notes, the Narrative Gym for Business, 75 pages, um, to use the ABT. Thank you so much, Park, for coming on to the show and congrats on all the people that you're helping with this. Oh, well, Ashley, thank you very much. And if any of your audience wants to actually take a quick little micro training course on the ABT, they can go to businessofstory.com forward slash ABT. You guessed it. And that'll take them to the Thinkific course. And in under an hour, they can use it, learn it, and put it to work for themselves. Wow, that's awesome. What a bite-sized, useful thing for anybody to do. I'm so appreciative of you coming on. Thank you, Ashley. I've enjoyed it.